Yeah, so I'm uh, Liz Wimdorf, um, and I'll um, discuss um, developments and applications of uh, our sample error estimation functions, um, which is a, uh, a project that we <coughs> have around here at the CAMD DCU, and is now also continuing in the Sunset in the US. Um, and today I'll um, put the most focus on the error estimation part of it because I believe that most of you are probably not too familiar with this. So, um, so this is just one slide uh, illustrating uh, um, uh, important goals of what many of us do. But this is uh, say in computational materials design. So here, um, as you know, this recently considered NLP composition, that is, decomposition of uh, NO information on nitrogen and oxygen on these two on one services. And uh, what went into uh, to producing this graph was so lots of DFC calculations of um, barriers and absorption energies of uh, NO, N2, and O2 and other stuff. And um, putting all that data into a microkinetic model, one is then eventually able to produce such a volcano plot such as this, which may be interpreted in many different ways. Um, but it's really the, uh, the rate of, uh, of NO decomposition plotted against the, uh, the, uh, the barriers towards oxygen dissociation and oxygen dissociation. And uh, so what should such a study be used for? Well, it should be used to evaluate uh, known and uh, potentially unknown uh, materials for, for such a process. So, so, so the, uh, the outcome of such a study might be sort of encapsulated in a volcano or something like this. And certain conclusions about what should the optimal material be. Um, so such a function, or such a study is usually done using some exchange correlation function, a model of exchange correlation effects in uh, in conjunctivity. Um, and we all know that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the predictions we make depend a lot on which function one uses. Here, for example, I'm plotting the, um, the consumption energy of CO and platinum versus the uh, surface energy of platinum. And uh, we see that using different functionals, the one means all of them, um, very different results can come out. So the blue line is sort of a fit to, uh, to the blue GTA um, points. The red ones are different flavors of Vanderbilt's DFs. There's an RPA point also. The experiment is actually all, all the way over here. And there are two green dots here with the red GTA functions, which is a uh, different, sort of different flavor. Um, and the main point in here is that um, you can get very different numbers uh, depending on what one chooses to do. Um, so, so, so does that have an effect in the end on the scientific conclusion that is? Uh, this was uh, sort of uh, investigated at least in part uh, back in 2004 by Hunter and others, where they were considering ammonia synthesis on ruthenium. And uh, at least as part of that study, um, which was done using RPD, they constructed, like continuously constructed exchange collision functions or turnover rates um, versus a mixing of GTAs. That is, here is the RPD plot. Point and then I continuously uh, turning the description over to the PW91 description, uh, this curve was mapped out. And what's interesting is that the rate is actually didn't seem to be too sensitive to um, which functional one was using in that case. And that's uh, also because of um, um, correlation effects, compensation effects. Um, so so, so the, uh, the actual choice of uh, functional doesn't always matter. But um, how do we know if it does? Um, so some of the questions we ask ourselves is um, what is actually the influence on the scientific conclusions that we draw in the end um, of the, uh, the inherent variations of our DT predictions that we draw there? And uh, we choose to sort of formulate the question in uh, a bit more precise way, that is, how can we reliably estimate the errors of, say, DMT uh, double DTAs or DTAs E? Um, <coughs> similar um, challenges are met in, in weather forecasting. So we all know that there is no exact model of uh, how the weather behaves. 
and there are different models, and if you feed different initial conditions to the same models, you will also get different results. <coughs> so they use um, quite a lot uh, use this ensemble approach. So um, it doesn't really matter what the lines are, it's simply an observable coming out of running a weather model prediction. And um, all the yellow ones are different results coming out of using different initial conditions for this uh, weather model. And, um, the reddish line here is then the, uh, the, the mean of those predictions. So one can sort of use such a plot to, to look at, okay, so how confident can we be in, in, in what we actually, in how we predict the weather to be tomorrow. That's sort of the, the same uh, ideas going into using or developing ensemble functionals. Um, this uh, started some while ago now, uh, where John and others were looking at ensemble functions uh, in GTA model space. So here's the GTA model space. Total energy is um, lots of stuff. Kinetic energy is half the potential everything. And then it's GTA change correlation. And the exchange part of that it can be described through this integral over blah blah with the exchange enhancement factor, which the, was then chosen to parameterize. Um, the, the result is over here where the, the best fit enhancement factor is plotted uh, as the solid flat line here. Then an ensemble of different functionals around the, uh, the best fit one. And um, so the, the model was eventually chosen by. Um, minimizing sort of the cost function that is one measure of the fitting of the functional and the ensemble of models around the optimum one uh, is related to the probability distribution for the parameters. So, so we know that this is not an exact model at all um, but we can define an ensemble around the, uh, the optimum one um, that sort of spans the, the errors that we know that the functional makes. Um, if you also look at it like this, over here, if we say this is now a model space where the exact function is right there, then all GJs you can think about are like within this uh, gray area over here, and will never e ever end up up here at the exact functional. But we can, we can make a functional that is right here at this point, and then create an ensemble of functionals that are around in the model space. Um, and then one can calculate using this ensemble of functionals a, uh, a Bayesian error estimate of the, uh, the error, of the, uh, yeah, actually the error on the quantity you just calculated. So uh, it's calculated like this. It's actually a sort of standard deviation. So in this sum, we have the difference between the observable calculated by the best fit functional, that is the actual functional, and then a number of uh, different predictions using different ensemble functions. So different functions that are in this region in here. So the, um, this, uh, this error estimate is then defined as the standard deviation, or the mean squared error, if you like, um, uh, of all these, uh, these differences. Um, and in the end, one should uh, obtain Errors that all follow this normal distribution. So here, the, the um, on the x-axis here is the, the actual error delta O over the uh, the, um, the error estimate. So this should hopefully peak around zero, and it uh, and it does. Um, in that same paper back in days. Um, one illustration of how to use such an example was uh, looking at here the, uh, the difference between the structural entities of the PCC and FCC copper and also the, uh, the cohesive entity of the copper crystal. And uh, what was shown was also what we know intuitively that the, the, uh, the uncertainty on the cohesive entity is much, much larger than the uncertainty of the preference for FCC or PCC structure which conforms very nicely with the with, um, studies made by Hans Grimmel back in the days where he showed that most DT calculations actually do predict the right structures. Um, however, those functions were not, or that function was not really made to, uh, to be used as such. It was uh, made to, to be used as a functional. It was mainly used to uh, define, to uh, show how this uh, how such an ensemble could be used. So with the BVDB, um, we took those ideas and, um, and create a function that was actually supposed to be, to be used in real calculations. 
So we use a GTA plus VDB model space where we expand the GTA exchange in, in the basis of the polynomial. And the correlation we then um, describe as a linear combination of LDA and PB correlation and this uh, non local um, uh, correlation for, uh, for fan of dispersion. And um, what came out of it was the functional I want. So these are all different data sets um, of different properties. That's my sentiment energies, consumption energies, and say lattice constants and such. And the point about that figure is that the BVDB is, is, is a very broad functional that is not really the best for, 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 for most things, but the, for not either the, the worst for, for anything really. Um, it's already been applied in a number of uh, cases. Here is a recent one by Rasmus Bobo, where he was uh, looking at the physicists of NL chains in, uh, in uh, set 22 a C line. And um, it's pretty obvious from this picture where the adsorption entity versus the number of carbon atoms, that is the length of the alkenes. Here is a picture of where it's physicist in this C line channel. Um, it's pretty obvious that doing a standard RPB calculation does not work. It does not um, predict any sort of binding, uh, rather repulsion actually, whereas. Uh, PVDB does rather well as compared to, to experimental numbers. Um, so, so here is the ensemble in, in, from the PVDB. I have here the exchange enhancement factor in, in, in black, and then an ensemble of functions around, um, which sort of spreads in this model space as, um, as a function of the reduced density gradient. What's noteworthy is that the ensemble spreads out a lot after S equals 2 which indicates that the actual, um, let's say, position of the black line in this region up here is much less confined than, than in here, which means that for small s, it's much more important what the, what the enhancement factor actually is. We also have the distribution of this um, correlation mixing parameter, which is a nice bell-shaped curve around the 0.6, which is the, the actual fitted value. Um, so it's really simple and it's really, really fast to, uh, to, to obtain these error estimates. Um, just one example here, so that, um, <coughs> it's implemented it's using, I, I implemented at least so that it's using both G power and AAC actually. So just assuming that I did a calculation and say that it has a G power power, I import it and then I create this uh, example. And then in order to get, um, say, 2,000 estimates or 2,000 total entities calculated with 2,000 different ensemble functions around the optimum one. I just uh, call this get ensemble entities. So if I do this for uh, all the different calculations that goes into, say, the consortium entity, I just subtract them from each other just as the ordinary total entities and do the standard deviation on those predictions, and that's then the, the error estimate. It's done not so consistently uh, in G power, so it's, it's really fast as long as the solution is done. Um, so, <clears throat> so, so, so what G power does in this scheme is really just supply uh, a, an array of 31 different uh, non self consistent uh, total entities, and then in ABC, <clears throat> um, this array is multiplied with uh, some random vectors in order to. To, uh, to create these, uh, an arbitrary amount of um, total energy prediction. It all happens uh, pretty automatically when just um, calling this uh, um, <coughs> So since it's so simple, um, it's also interesting to, to make other codes to use this. It's, uh, the ensemble is a very, very important part of the BVB construction. And uh, Johan Struss at the Suncat is, uh, has worked on Quite far now with um, implementing BVD and the ensemble in the last and quantum espresso. And uh, since um, um, since the ASE has uh, interfaces for us at least, and uh, perhaps also quantum espresso at some point, um, <coughs> doing this function with uh, this ASE function here would then be able to uh, to get these this such an array of total energies from, uh, from any calculator that just supports BVD. So it's really nice, that's the way to go to sort of uh, spread the word. Um, 
this is just a quick example of, uh, of how I actually do it. So here I'm just looking at consumption of CO and rhodium one from one, and I uh, go through a loop over different uh, color, different uh, G, uh, GPV files. And here I'm just here I'm calculating the absorption energy. Here I'm calculating 2,000 different uh, predictions of the absorption energy, and um, define and I define the error estimate as a standard deviation on over those predictions. The predictions are, are they follow a Gaussian which is centered at the uh, at, at the actual absorption energy. So if you, you know, if you can do the standard deviation or the root mean square deviation, it's not the same. And this is then what it looks like when I run this script. So, um, so my GT calculation is predicted 1.6 dB, which is um, off by 0.5 dB, 0.15 dB, and the error estimate turns out to be 0.17 dB. So that's all true, I would say, because that's just one single calculation, and then you say, okay, it's, it's not accurate, or it's not exact, you mean that already. What's much more uh, interesting in is when these error estimates propagate through, um, say, for example, a microchemical model, then in the end it comes up with uh, such a volcano. So here, uh, this is very recent work, done uh, mainly by Turin, who so was the Benjamin's PhD thesis in a few months. So here, um, we'd like to ask the question, what is the probability that some certain metal alloy that we don't know about um, will it be more active than, up -active than platinum for, for NOT composition. So we don't want to know if there's going to be some element that is better than platinum. We want to know what's the, what's the, um, what's the probability that um, an element is going to be 10 times better than platinum or a million times better. So here, um, here we are, here to hinder the uh, ensemble predictions for the, um, in such a volcano probably, um, for these different elements all relative to platinum. So platinum is just a dot right there. So, so, so these are 2,000 predictions of, uh, 2,000 different predictions for this uh, surface here of what is the, uh, what's the barrier towards O2 dissociation and N2 dissociation. These are the quantities that will go into any microcomputer model. So uh, one can end up with something like this, which is very interesting. So um, <clears throat> four different plots here. The one upper left here simply uh, and we have a probability scale ranging from zero to one on each side here. So uh, so this area in here simply shows that this is the area on the volcano where you should go if you want to find some a metal or an alloy, a compound, whatever, that's uh, more active than the camera. And using these um, ensemble um, techniques, we can, uh, we can also say, okay, so how about, where, where should I go if I want a high probability for finding an alloy that's more than 100 times better than that? Or say, uh, more than 10,000 times better than that? Maybe we should want to go down here. Um, and you can ask any sorts of probability, pro probabilistic questions as long as you have, for each of your total energy that uh, you're using, have an ensemble of predictions for those total energies. So, um, so in summary, um, the beef, the ensemble that is designed together with the beef VDD function is else useful and as important as the BVDD functional itself. Um, it offers a systematic and quantitative framework for assessing what are errors on our predictions and how do these errors propagate with each other. For example, if, um, if one ensemble functional predicts that the, um, the intro dissociation entity is significantly lower than, than the BVDD does, then you'll see a similar uh, effect on the O2 dissociation energy because these scale are there. And the ensemble captures these correlations between quantities. Um, that, that goes way beyond simple um, probabilistic um, say approaches where you say, well, there's uh, this sort of error on these and this sort of error on these, and then we add them up and take the square root and then it's combined with um, This is a totally different game. Um, so these sort of 
probabilistic um, approaches to the volcano class, we are new company that are going to be important in the future as well. And the beef DVD is currently the only function that's able to do that. Uh, but we're working on more than just beef DVD, um, which was a GTA exchange plus an issue plus the handoff one. Uh, right now we are finishing up stuff, uh, work on uh, <coughs> exchange, which some of you may have noticed in my check-ins on the G-files to come this perspective. Um, we got to couple this to some sort of non-local correlation also. We have the like Lundquist formulation or a different one, we don't know yet. And um, since, at some kind at least, um, we are very focused on uh, treating oxide synthesis and pop oxides at some point, we are very eager to, to try out our, our uh, framework uh, with the screen acceptance. <coughs> So, who's on the project? Well, Kun Lungo and uh, Carsten Jakobsen, definitely. Uh, and uh, at some point, Jens Nasko and Tom Spinkler. So, this, uh, this work was done uh, to a great deal at Camp D and, and also at some point, actually, which is funded by the US Department of Thank you. at some point that you are actually doing, I think, 29 calculations in between and somehow blowing that up to an ensemble of 2,000. Is that correct? Or yeah. are you actually doing 2,000? No. No, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's something I didn't want to uh, go into. Mm. Um, <laughs> Sorry. That's <laughs> okay. It's, um, once you have, so the, um, the functional has 31 parameters. 30 for the exchange and then one for this mixing. So that's 31 parameters. So we obtain, uh, so, 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 uh, so, so we only need G power to calculate 31 total entities, which then go into um, um, parameterization. I mean, that you just multiply coefficients onto them. And so we choose 2,000 random sets of those coefficients. 
make sense? Yeah. Okay, so, so it's only 31 deep operations. Non self consistent, it takes less than a minute. And, and the actual information about the sample is in the width in the distributions of those 20, 32 parameters. So one of them may have a very narrow distribution, another very broad if it's a less important parameter. Is that correct? I mean, there must somehow be more information. Uh, uh, since you're bothering to do 2,000 and not 32 images, there must be some more information in, in having that sampling. So, so, so one, one yellow line here is the result of, uh, is, is parameterized by 30 parameters. Huh? That is uh, a super protocol number, first of all, the second one, and so on. So you need, um, you need Exchange contributions from those 30 polynomials and then the one for the correlation also. And then you have 2,000 such lines. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, not 2,000, but, but you can make yeah. square. It's not, it's just randomly selected from a distribution. Or you can choose as many lines from that distribution. So you don't need 31 total entities, which you then just multiply out of the. I think I understand. Good. Okay. And, um, well, Contributors to the Hanabas with the functional. Uh, I had some issues uh, with this approach. And uh, <clears throat> some of the things we just uh, looked at is the, the fact that the exchange, uh, as you go outside of the surface, will have a different uh, decay in terms of the weight of this. So, in, in fact, so in some sense, the choice of choosing of, of an exchange has different weight of decay of the magnitude than do the, um, the correlation, including the one of the correlation. Um, the problem is then that you can, it basically works as a log line, right? so that the derivatives between the difference between the weighting between these change of correlations is different. And so basically what you're fitting here is in some sense a log line that modifies the number of things. But there are now two different uh, approximations for the normal correlations. So I guess I'm interested in knowing what is your error estimate on under last year one, under last year zero, which is the one in 2003, and the one in 2010, which is under last year two. Can you project that out from that? Are you doing, I mean, with this kind of information, would you actually be able to tell me what is the probability that I that I that we have the right functional in 2004 and the wrong one for the number of correlations in 2000. That's a, that's a really good point. Um, as far as I recall, I'm not sure. Or should we do another? Yeah. I mean, you trust us a lot. Hmm. Correct. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Help me make yeah, it better. So, um, I'm pretty sure that um, it should be, in principle, it should be possible to. Um, to sort of project out what would the errors be on a certain functional estimate. Yeah, estimate, definitely. But it's not really, really simple because that would be described by one, one simple set of... Uh, yeah, but it's a very simpler approach. Exactly. And, and, and I'm not recommending that you start fitting that around either. I mean, I mean, that's all I'm saying. But I just wanted to know if you could tell us. An example like this, um, relies on um, the cost function that defines whether um, how constrained the model is. So, so this cost function allows the model to, uh, to start at a very constrained place or a very, a very constrained um, state. Well, it must, it must be constrained unless you put the square term has to be constrained. Eh? Yeah, that's right, that's right. But, 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 okay. then we, by loosening up on this cost function, we allow the model to be more and more complex. And then we're looking for, okay, so when is it too complex and when is it too little complex to get that. Um, so somehow, this ensemble idea is quite intricately related to the fact that it's parameterized in a very free way. But, but I'm pretty sure, I don't think it was published, but I'm pretty sure that it should be possible to protect out, uh, say, is a particular form as, as you suggest. One thing I should notice is or notice that um, this ensemble, that is the exchange ensemble and the correlation ensemble, does not allow the non-local correlation to vary at all. No, I never said that. That's why that's why that's why 
it's like, it's like, a, like a, uh, yeah. a restrictor on that. That's fine. So that's why I'm not sure that you could do it. But I would be interested in knowing what would, if you did the, let's say, the materials genome mm -hmm. for me, and then you came back and said 0.7, and I told them, what does that mean? And you would tell me, and then I would be, you know, be interested, right? Yeah. Um, we don't do that, but it's very delicate because um, it, can, it, it can have significant more. The data that can represent um, what should the long range table of dispersion be, mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be small numbers, and it's, um, it will be very, it's very hard to fit technically. But then I could come back and say, I'm not really interested in the asymptote for reasons I will tell them what I told Okay, I think we can continue the discussion. Got it, Ray? There was, or maybe it can go on. Okay. So let's.